Blockchain and education, so interesting ideas that we have on, on how education can profit from using the blockchain. So there are some really interesting educational usage for this, but right now that blockchain seems to be just limited to the student's academic record. And that's actually really not that bad idea. The problem we run into is that that academic record is initially protected by FERPA. And the way the system is set up now is that we basically can go ahead and pull down any official academic record through a clearinghouse that, you know, basically you'll go to some clearinghouse, you'll order your transcripts, your transcripts will be sent to your employer or to your new college. And then that's how the system works. Now, it would be really interesting on if it was in the blockchain, mostly because when you request a record, I, as a student, have to request that record. It's also missing all the things that I do on Udemy, it's also missing all the other training that I've done, like boot camps or um, CPEs or other things like that, CEUs. So, yeah, this is going to be interesting, right? That public academic record creates a problem beyond blockchain as the blockchain by purpose is transparent. So we really can't have protected information included in the blockchain unless approved by the student for release. So when you sign that thing that says, boom, um, I consent, there's your loophole. So FERPA issues, right? The Family Educational Rights and Privacy Act is a really interesting federal law, and it's a really good law. It's one of the few laws that uh, actually really does work really, really well, right? And it applies to all schools that receive funds under um, applicable program of the U.S. Department of Education. So if you are not receiving money from DOE, this doesn't apply to you. Your student record can be released any way, shape, or form that you want. So. And the core of the law is that parents or eligible students have the right to inspect and review the student's education records. All right, schools are not required to provide records or copies unless for reasons of distance, it's impossible for parents or eligible students to review the records. Schools can charge a fee. Parents or eligible students have the right to request the school correct records. And this is the big one that they believe to be inaccurate or misleading. Remember, the blockchain is immutable. Once that record hits the blockchain, once it realized, once my employers realized that I failed my core HTML programming class two times before I passed it, right? Um, it could be misleading. It's not inaccurate, but it could be misleading because, you know, hey, instructor, it's not my fault. You know the story, right? So if the school decides not to amend the record, the parent or um, eligible student has a right to formal hearing and then after the hearing. So how do you take out what the parent or the student thinks is inaccurate or misleading information? What happens if the student was let go from the college for a cause and they want that pulled from the record? You don't want to have um, in your permanent record something the employer is going to go see that the student was released from, from Harvard for cause. Um, that's not what you want to see. So there's no way to amend that record once you're in the blockchain. And we haven't worked out the ramifications of having that kind of information in the blockchain, right? And we have no way of really um, working with contested information inside the blockchain yet. We really don't. They're just not there. So that core of the law is going to be problem problematic. Releaseability. Generally, schools must have written permission from the parent or eligible student in order to release information. So FERPA allows schools to disclose their records without consent to other people, right, without any big issues on that one. It's other school officials with legitimate educational interests. So say I move from one school to another school. That's a legitimate interest. You need to know what I did, what I learned, what my skills were. Other schools or students transferring, again, legitimate educational interest, specified officials for audit or evaluation purposes. We all go through certification. We go, all go through audits. Um, we can be um, audited by CHIA or by anybody else that we need to. Um, so, yeah, uh, student records are open for that. Appropriate parties in connection with financial aid. And that's the other thing. Make sure that you actually passed your classes. Otherwise, you have to pay back uh, for anybody that's done VA. If you fail your class, you have to give the VA back the money for that class, and that can be a burden. Um, then organizations conducting studies on behalf of the school. So if you've opened up your school records to researchers, there's a thing. Accrediting organizations to comply with a judicial order or lawfully sub issued subpoena, especially if it's Title IX. Um, schools get sued all the time. And then appropriate officials in case of health or safety emergencies, right? We need to know where you are or something else. And then state and local authorities, juvenile justice, pursuant to specific state laws. Again, there are lots of loopholes here. But the big one is what can we actually do? 
So schools may disclose without consent something called directory information, students' name, address, phone number, date, and place of birth, honors, awards, and dates of attendance. Not a problem. However, schools must tell parents and eligible students about directory information and allow parents and eligible students a reasonable amount of time to request a school not disclose directory information about them, especially that address and phone number, date and place of birth. Those are all things that are really, really good for identity theft. I mean, really good for identity theft, especially if they have something like dates of attendance, who's your favorite instructor, you know, when did you go to school? What was your degree? If you have anything like that for a security question, directory information is a great start for, for trying to hack an identity. Now, schools must notify parents and eligible students annually of their rights under FERPA. Just keep you reminded that you do have certain rights and obligations behind that. And how that notification is made is at the discretion of each school. So your core issues when it comes to doing this in the blockchain, right, are going to be data governance. How do we, con how do we manage that data? Who do we share that data with? How do we avoid disclosure or how do we avoid the problems with disclosure? And then how do we stay true to FERPA but still do what we need to do inside the blockchain? So for your data governance, educational data is more than just school. It's more than just the school you, you went to. It's more than just the fact that you went to now University of Maryland. It's more than that. So it's not just that. It's your diplomas. It's your degrees. It's your credit hours, your CE use any kind of honors like Delta Mu or NSLS, um, any kind of certifications you've gotten through Udemy, Coursera, edX. If you went to a vocational program, if you went to a boot camp, anything like that, any kind of badges or credentials you got, AWS, and is your both issue badges as you hit milestones in your learning with them any kind of continuing education and extension course. Maybe you did a pottery course or you did a photography course as part of continuing education. And then any kind of experiences that you led that led to learning, apprenticeship training, huge in electrical and plumbing and construction. That apprentice training would be great to be able to document how much hours do you have in a plane? You know, <laughs> all those things that lead to that learning experience. So this is a lot of data and a person will generate over their lifetime a ton of data that's like this so you may have gotten a degree in culinary school but ended up welding containers for waste management but all that stuff is other apprentice training or something else you may want to stay a good cook a good culinary chef so you do some ceus on that maybe you did a little bit of udemy or coursera courses on it Maybe you went to a vocational program when your job welding containers ended and you wanted to get back into being a restaurant owner. So you went to a vocational program. Again, all of that stuff is really an interesting journey that we make every day. So while this is protected information, only parts of this is personally identifiable information protected under FERPA. So some of this is directory, but data has a different disclosure rules to law enforcement and third party systems that once granted cannot be taken back there's the loophole that's the big one that's the one you really want to pay attention to so they do talk about best practices so you need to convey the limitations of the data especially if it's in the blockchain you need to make sure that you've ensured your authorized representatives knows the limitations on the use of the data what kind of limitations are we going to put on data in the blockchain it's probably just better to make sure that that data that's in the blockchain is already limited just to what someone needs to have. Obtain assurances against redisclosure. You can't do that in the blockchain. The blockchain is transparent unless you're doing a private blockchain that has some kind of encryption around it, right? So if your authorized representative says the data will not be redisclosed without your permission, then you're going to need to make sure that you've got a mechanism in place inside the blockchain for that data destruction. There are some data that's just not worth keeping after seven years. And this is a pretty set idea on this one. So you've got to be clear about how data is destroyed. You have to set clear expectations, but I can't destroy data in the blockchain. Once it's in there, it's in there. You have to maintain a right to audit. So the right to conduct audits or other monitoring act activities of your representative's policies, procedures, and systems, you're probably going to forget about it until it crops up. And then you're going to go, wow, where did that come from? Because you will have forgotten about it. And then verify the existence of disciplinary policies to protect the data. You may want to verify that your authorized representative has appropriate policies for employees that violate FERPA. So unless you've released it, unless you've given that consent, if someone put your data in the blockchain and you didn't want it there, 
um, that's a violation of FERPA, and that can include termination, but that's at the discretion of the company or the school that did that, in, that involuntary disclosure. So there are some other best practices that go along with this. Um, sound state data security plan, data stewardship programs, disclosing PII from educational records as needed, right? And then know who you're disclosing data to in the blockchain. You don't. Anyone can go back through and data mine that. Um, it would be really interesting having that because then you know who all is working on Udemy, who all is working on Coursera, who all has completed certain practices, certain courses, other things. And then a verify training. Make sure that your authorized representative training has a program to teach their employees about how FERPA is and about how to protect PII. So this is important when you're kind of going into it because if you're going to issue things in the blockchain, you really need to understand how FERPA works. You really do. So educational data sharing, though, makes for that whole more interesting end of the story here. So educational institutions across the country rely on sharing data, and they really do. We share data with the feds, we share data with the state, everyone's got a department of education that comes along and we're going to measure student outcomes, we're going to say uh, your ITT tech, if you don't have certain outcomes you need to do a thing, if you're uh, University of Phoenix, if you're University of Maryland, all this stuff is set up to evaluate the effectiveness of educational programs and the data sharing is huge under the background. While the general rule for FERPA is that PII from educational records cannot be disclosed without written consent, FERPA includes exceptions that permit data sharing under certain con conditions with agencies, vendors, or individuals. And again, that's where you're going to conduct your studies, that's where you're going to do your audit or evaluation programs, um, law enforcement, federal legal requirements, or in the case of responding to a health or safety emergency, I mean, you need to know how to contact your parents. In addition, in some circumstances, FERPA allows educational institutions to share data with contractors, volunteers, or other individuals performing services for the educational institution. And that's going to take your instructors, um, people who are part-time working in the HR office or other places. So you're going to have written agreements, and everyone's going to understand their role in protecting student data. But again, the blockchain takes away a lot of this stuff. And this is the loophole. This is the best loophole ever done. The disclosure of PII from student education records must be for or on behalf of an educational agency or institution in order to A, develop, validate, or administer predictive tests, administer student aid programs, improve instruction, an educational agency or institution may disclose PII from educational rep records, and a FERPA-permitted entity may disclose may redisclose PI only if the disclosing educational entity enters into a written agreement with the organization. So if you are on the blockchain with your records and there's a disclosing educational entity, such as your college, enters into a written agreement with Coinbase or some other person that makes a, a blockchain, and you have given consent to release of your records, because most of us are going to sign a consent form for that because we have to as part of accreditation, as part of research, as part of a bunch of other things. There's your loophole. Disclosing educational entity enters into a written agreement with the organization. And that can be anybody. So kind of a neat thing, right? Um, and there are actually people doing things. So I brought up Coindesk earlier. So educational da data sharing is already happening. Um, it's happening all over the place. And again, this is where the Chinese have taken a huge, huge leap um, ahead of everybody else on this one. So the blockchain technology emerges as a potential solution to longstanding problems. And again, if I took some courses in China, uh, if I took some courses in India, if I took some courses someplace else, my educational record across countries and across subjects can follow me. So there's important drivers in this, and universities have failed, though, to realize the potential of blockchain for their own use. And it's basically a toy right now. It's being used, but it's not really being used. But what is interesting is who is being used by. Um, you have some real big first-tier companies here doing things, and it makes it all the more interesting along the way in terms of how they're doing things. Of course, things like MIT and Stanford are in there. But what's even more interesting is Singapore, Melbourne, California, um, University of Zurich, Hong Kong, um, Chinese University of Hong Kong. Again, just a fascinating group of people that are in there trying to drive this change. We have a case study with maryville.edu, it's a college, and they actually have a primary focus of examining how blockchain can facilitate record sharing. It is a great program to go take a look at in terms of how that works. 
So the EBI, they, they've got a bunch of grants, they made some money, um, such as Student One, which provides Nebraska K-12 through students, which gives them a blockchain-based educational record, um, and then Unblocked, which is an open exchange to simplify college credit transfers. As long as the data is clean, as long as the data isn't in any way considered derogatory, so sort of like me failing a class twice and finally passing it on the third go, if they would take out that first and second failure and gave me a third go, um, I would be fine with having my stuff in the blockchain, mostly just because I'm embarrassed that I failed a basic HTML course, right? Data disclosure avoidance. This is another neat loophole trick that you can pull refers to the efforts made to reduce the risk of disclosure, such as applying statistical methods to protect TII. So basically, de-aggregate your data. Make sure that you de-identify data and there's an actual process around um, actual disclosure avoidance methods. And if you can de-identify that data only to a user ID or only to a student ID um, for the blockchain that is separate from their regular um, student ID that's just locked away somewhere in some file folder um, on some educational process at all. As long as you can keep that original blockchain student ID, you can de-identify that information from a specific person unless I'm going ahead and saying, okay, Mr. Employer, here's my QR code. Here's all my educational attainment. Here's my Udemy. Here's my Coursera. Here's my formal college. Here's my CPEs. Here's my CEUs. Here's my bartending license because all of that is stuff I've done and you can actually de-aggregate the data in a lot of ways. So the release of any data carries at least some element of risk. All right, and that's just the truth. Um, someone may, and someone has already gone through de-identified data, especially if you go back and you remember the AOL data leak where people were actually going back and figuring out who was pregnant, who had cancer, who was doing this long before the person had told anybody. And there's that old story of Amazon where um, a teenage daughter was, where Amazon knew that the teenage daughter was pregnant before the family did. And again, it's kind of that risk you're going to get. It's going to happen. It's happening now. Um, organizations disclosing the data in the form of public aggregate records are responsible for minimizing. So the school that's going to go ahead and turn your educational attainment over to um, the blockchain, it's their requirement to make sure that, that there is something done to try to make sure that it's not pointing to me and then before each plan release, an organization must determine the acceptable risk. And you may actually want to hold back release until the student or the parents say, yes, this data is releasable, because we do have that right of, of being able to challenge things along the way. So you do want to kind of make sure of what you've got there in terms of that challenge portion of FERPA. And that if you wait until that challenge has expired over 30 days or 90 days post whenever the term ended um, to update that record, then that's another thing that you can do. And then more avoidance. Probably, again, the most common one is data suppression, blurring and perturbation. So you're going to have to, as a company, figure out which way you want to go. But it is a loophole. It is a way of making sure that you don't run into um, a lot of problems with disclosure. And then consent. All right, so the consent agreement, all of this, all of this process can be avoided by just getting consent from the student to store the data in a third-party clearinghouse. And we do this already, right? All of my transcripts now are in third-party clearinghouses. I won't contact the University of Maryland. I will contact a third-party clearinghouse. I won't contact North Central. I will contact a third-party clearinghouse. So I've already consented. And so I'm not worried about it if it shows up in the blockchain. Others may be. So process is already in place. The consent agreements are already in place and the systems are already in place. It depends on if that clearinghouse um, can actually start functioning on the blockchain itself. So again, we have a lot of places we get this kind of information from and some of this is for and again, some of this is not. But again, what have I done? What data is collected about me? Um, where does it go? Where is it stored? How is it stored? Who has access to it? Who has control over it? And again, over my lifetime, I've gone to more classes than I know what to do with. I literally go to school every day just because I find it fun. So how do we take all these little chunks of data? And this is the part that we have not solved for yet. And this is the part that makes this such an interesting technology when it comes to education, is that we have all these things. We've learned things on the job. We've learned things off the job. We've been unemployed. We went through workforce, boot camps. Um, I learned stuff as a manager. I learned stuff as a program chair. I've learned a lot of things as I've gone through my career and my times. So 
Each instance of interaction within the student and the educational system requires a different response and how the data is protected in the blockchain. And there's kind of an interesting portion on this and that everything that's no, yeah, I can just go ahead and do and let it go. High school releases, official transcripts to a university, boom, done, you know, that's a given. But if I'm gonna go ahead and release the official transcripts of skill building to a boot camp, well, I have to have that authorization to do that. So the really interesting ways of looking at data transfer inside the educational system when it comes to how we want to handle data confluence. And the big thing is that so little of this really needs that FERPA consent, as long as you understand how FERPA works and the loophole with FERPA with that third party consent. So in general, in summary, Blockchain is still underutilized in education. There really isn't a real good solution here. There are some interesting solutions. There are some interesting code sets out on GitHub. Right? It's mostly the province of colleges right now who are leading edge technology colleges. Right? Um, it's a global effort now, which is great. I love seeing the Chinese and Swiss and the Americans in there doing this. This is awesome. There are loopholes in FERPA especially third-party consent and disclosure um, that for both directory and non-directory information so as long as we have that piece of paper signed uh, don't have to worry about it that can be a digital signature it can be a smart contract right there's no real mechanism to go back and dispute information in the blockchain and that's going to be a big hitch right especially if someone didn't pay attention to what was in the blockchain or something adverse got put into the blockchain and was not found out about until an employer brought it up and wanted to know why you were released from Harvard for a cause. And that may be information you want to keep suppressed, but it's going to be part of your educational record that you were kicked out of Harvard. So we have to be able to dispute that information or suppress information within the blockchain, especially if we have things that are derogatory that over time just don't matter anymore. So there's a path through data protection for lifelong learners, but it relies more on that global central blockchain. And that global central blockchain just simply does not exist yet. It's going to have to exist in multiple languages, a single format with a very trusted authority owning that entire blockchain and how those blocks are added and how the data is validated. So it's really kind of neat what's going on in education right now. And it's definitely something to take a look at. And we're going to go and we're going to take a look at some of the code behind all this um, that's been generated, just so you guys can kind of see how it's all put together. And thank you for being part of this lecture. And I will see you in the next one.